Very warm greetings to all in the blessed name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Let's turn our Bibles to First Peter, to First Peter, chapter fourteen, uh, chapter chap- chapter one, verses fourteen to sixteen. Chapter one of First Peter. Verses 14 to 16. Tonight, we move to the new characteristics to study regarding how men will be unholy, unholy in perilous times. But first, let us look at 1 Peter. Let's read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 to 16. Reading, As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves, according to the former lusts in your ignorance. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. May God bless the reading of his word. Let us all turn to God in prayer. Eternal Almighty God, we thank you for journey mercies to thy house. It is by thy... um, providence and thy leading alone and that we are found here in this blessed place of prayer in the house of prayer tonight and father we come first and foremost seeking once again the thorough cleansing washing purging purifying of our souls lord may thou remove our sins from us tonight and cleanse them in the blood of our savior for as we gather to seek thy face we know that we cannot come with unclean hands in pure hearts <coughs> So we pray for your mercies. And now as we consider this characteristic of unholiness in us in the end times, in perilous times, may you be merciful to send your Holy Spirit to be our teacher that we not only understand, but Lord, we would desire to live holy lives. We pray for the young ones. We pray for the elderly. We pray for all. Lord, may you grant to us understanding, a focus, and above all, O God, be merciful to work in our hearts. And when you do so, may each one of us yield ourselves to you. Be with us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've memorized, God says, Know also that in last days perilous times shall come. And one of the perilous behavior of men and women is that we would be unholy. Now, do not forget, 1 Timothy 3 is not written, to, not written about unbelievers. We've seen that in Romans. He wrote about unbelievers in 1 Timothy chapter 1. But here it is very specific. It is about people that will appear in the church. How do we know that? How do we know that? Because we are told to look, now look at verse 6. Oh, sorry, verse 5. Having a form of godliness, denying, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. These are people in the church that the Apostle Paul was warning Timothy about and to teach the congregation about unholy characteristics. How can it be? The people of God in the church of God, unholy. Now, is it not true? Is not the evidences right before our eyes today? When you think of what is happening to Christians in the church, your Christian friends at the workplace, in school that you know of, even elderly Christians, are Christians' life today not characterized by unholiness. Think of, just look at how Christians dress today. Immodest, impure, like the world, to be like the world. They do not care. In fact, Christians have become so unholy in their ways. They mock at other Christians who seek to live holy lives, who dress modestly, who don't listen to certain things, certain songs, who don't watch certain 
things, who don't go to certain places, they mock at you. They ridicule you. Christians have become so unholy that cohabitation, living together, not married, but just living together, premarital sex, are common things among Christians today. So common that pastors don't even blink an eye in churches today. Young people, young Christians, well, young and adults, go on holidays together, sleep in the same hotel rooms together. It has become so common that Christian parents even argue with pastors. Why, why do you make a fuss out of it? What's the big deal? Now, not too long back, an uh, elderly Christian called me and said, Pastor, I need your help. I say, yes, what can I do? He said, my, my children, they are having a big disagreement. My two grown-up daughters. I say, well, what's the problem? I'll try to use scriptures to help. And he said, one daughter has um, a child that is traveling with her boyfriend. They're going to their state to stay there. And I told, and the, the sister said, told the other sister, can you let my daughter stay in your house with her boyfriend? Now remember, these are all Christians. And the other daughter said, no, of course not. How can I do that? This is terrible. What kind of testimony will I bear to my church people? They are not married. Big argument between siblings. But even the mother, supposedly a Christian for decades, could not understand why the other sister was so upset, so angry, so unwilling to let this girl and the boyfriend stay in her house. Now, this is Christianity today. By the way, you may think, well, yeah, these are people that, that, that come from, well, um, unsound churches. No. It's a member of our church. How can these things be? You see, God says that in the end times, Christians in church will be unholy. Pastors caught in adulteries, stealing from the churches. Well, when you think of all these things, is it not true what God says? It is truly perilous times. But I know some of you in your heart, you think, well, pastor, don't worry, you know. We are not like that. My family is not like that. So we can move on to the next word about without natural affection. Now, is it true? God says in perilous times, churches will have people that are unholy. Well, if holiness is simply don't do this, don't do that, um, live a certain way outwardly, then yes, maybe we are quite safe because most of us know where to draw the line. In dressing, what we watch, where we go. So I think most of us would say we are quite all right. So we must first learn what is the meaning of unholy. Are we unholy? Personally, as a church, now, to learn what is unholy, first we have to learn what is holy, all right? Because the word unholy simply is the word holy with um, uh, another Greek um, word added in front to make it not, all right? Not holy. That is what it is. Not holy. First, let us learn what is holy. Actually, I really hope that you remember this word. What is holy? Holy, all right? Thomas is smiling a lot. What is holy? Set apart, very good. Holy, the word holy means to be set apart. All right, it's not just a set of actions that you do or don't do. The word simply means to be separated from. Separated from something onto something else. So first and foremost, 
we must understand what it means. Then we have to ask ourselves, then therefore am I unholy? Not dressing immodestly, not watching certain things, not singing certain songs, does not make me unholy. There is more than that. Now, God talks about the utensils, the furniture in the temple as holy. Now, how can utensils, how can the knives, um, the ladles, the, the pots, how can they be holy? If it simply means not immodest, don't listen to certain things, don't go to certain places. Why would God use the word holy? Make sure that this, he tell the people now, this furniture, this utensils, they are holy. What God means is they are now reserved and set apart and put aside for my use only. That's a key word. Only. Separated only to be dedicated and used for God. That is what it means, first and foremost. Now, so why, why is um, not going to certain places or why is going to certain sinful places unholy? Well, because we are supposed to be separated from those places. So when you understand holiness, then you realize why I do not go to certain places because I'm supposed to be separated from these places, not to be found there. Why do I dress a certain way? Because I should be separate. I should be set apart, different from the way the world dresses, when it, especially when it's immodest, when it's carnal, when it's um, worldly, sinful. The way that why I don't wear those things, don't watch those things, is because... I am supposed to be separate from them and on to God. There is an important thing to remember. I'm separate from them, from these things, and not just separate, but it must be on to God. Separating from secular to sacred, being set apart for certain purposes. Now, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14 and 6 to 16. Here, we want to learn what is holy. Then we learn what is unholy, all right? Now, God says, as obedient children, must we, we must remember, God here is speaking to believers, when he says, because it is written in verse 16, be holy for I am holy. He is talking to believers, children of God. Now, there are two things that we must remember regarding separation unto God. Now, first, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. Not fashioning yourself means don't conform to, don't um, follow, don't have your former lusts. Now, this talks about your desires. Holiness has to do with, well, what are your desires? I need to be separate from desires that are mine when there are desires that contradict God's word. All right? So, number one, separation is from your desires to God's desires, God's purposes. No more your lust, but God's will. That's the first thing. Now then he goes further in verse 15. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy, how? In all manner of conversation. We have studied this word many times. Conversation means your lifestyle, your walk, your obedience, in other words. All right, so when God talks about be ye holy, he brings up two things. One, the purposes, God's purposes, separate unto his purposes. No more your lust, but his will. The second thing is about your practices, your practices, your conversation, your lifestyle, your obedience to the word of God. 
So when we say be holy, what are we saying about? What are we talking about? That when it comes to my, the purposes in my life, when it comes to practices in my life, I am totally separated onto God's purposes and what God expects of me to do. Now today when we think of that, we have to ask ourselves, are we really holy as we think we are? Because if holiness means that, it means that, it now it means that I am absolutely and fully devoted to God. And everything that I pursue and do in my life is only to fulfill the purposes of God. And I separate myself from all my personal pursuits that would cause that would be a hindrance to me being totally devoted to doing the will of God. That is one. The second one. If holiness means that now, when it comes to what God says in His holy scriptures. I unconditionally surrender to obey it. I accept his word, his ways, his thoughts, his expectations. Totally. That's a key word. Because separation is, is consecration. It's not half-hearted. I accept, I embrace unreservedly every single instruction of God, even if it contradicts what I've always understood, what I've always preferred, what I've, what I've learned. That's why God says, your former lust. All the previous ideas that I had, but after I become a Christian, and this is the important part, Holiness is not you do it once and then it's over. Be holy is continuous command. It means as I live my Christian life and I discover more clearly purposes of God for the Christian that I did not understand when I was a younger Christian. And when I discover and when I come to learn commandments that in the past never occurred to me that this is what I'm supposed to do or I've been living this way. My parents taught me, even my Christian parents said this is fine. But along the way, when I began to realize what it means, for example, to keep the, day, the, the Sabbath day holy, what it means to be a father, what it means to be a mother, what it means to be a child, what it means to... and so on and so forth. I began to realize some things that I've never understood in the past, never knew in the past, I will now change myself and separate myself without any um, reservation. I will separate myself from what I used to do now to do what, God, what I've learned God wants me to do. Now, that is holiness. And therefore, it includes, I never understood, I never knew that listening to certain music was wrong. Then along the way, although my Christian friends, they listen to it, along the way, I begin to understand the origin of this music, what it does, what it's meant to do. And it's contrary to music that God created. I begin to understand these things. Then I separate myself away from this and onto God. So Christian, when you begin to understand that is holiness, then what is? What is unholy? What is unholy? Well, then unholy 
would mean I don't want to be, un I am unwilling to set myself apart for God. It means that I have reservations about living a fully consecrated life. I have reservation about that. It means then that I am, I struggle with and I'm not willing to surrender my life over to God's purposes totally for the rest of my life. To be unholy, then it means that I hold back, I hold back certain areas of my life, of my obedience, I hold it back from God. I will not, I will not devote my entire life, my entire being, my entire possession to God. Now, please, please remember, the holy utensil, the holy knife, for example, that is used to slaughter, to slay the animals for sacrifice. When it is holy, it means, God says, this knife is holy. What it means is this. This, life, this knife will not leave the temple. This knife will not be used for any other purposes. You can't use it to, well, you know, that tree, that tree is uh, growing, that, that plant is growing. I just use this knife and cut it. No, it's totally God's purpose, the purpose which he designed it for. You see, when God told them to build the temple, every single equipment, every single um, furniture was specifically designed, specifically um, um, made, dimensions, how it is to be made and all that, totally defined by God. The pot cannot be brought home to be used to cook something else. The priest cannot say, oh, I think well, this pot is quite good, you know, the conductivity well, hits it up very well. It's big. I have a big family. Maybe when, when, during the sacrifices are being performed, I use it for the temple for God. But you know, off-duty, when it's off-duty, I'll bring it home to use it for my family. You cannot do that because it is meant to be set apart, separated, just for that purpose. Now then we have to ask ourselves if unholy means I would not allow myself to be totally used only for God's purposes on earth. I can dress very modestly. I can not watch all these movies. I can be observing total abstinence. All these things I'm willing to do. But because of the failure of Christians in understanding this word holy, we therefore think we are holy. We are all right. Now, one of the traits of the end times is that God says the Christian will be unholy. It means a Christian would be unwilling to consecrate and devote their life and allow themselves to be fully used and only used by God. They will hold back the possessions that they have, whether it's money, whether it is abilities, whether it is their children, whether it's their singlehood, whether it's their marriage, whether it is their health. God says in the end times, Christians, they will not be willing to say, God, I unreservedly offer up myself to you wherever you send me, whatever you intend for my life. 
whatever you allow in my life, I fully embrace, I will not question, I joyfully fulfill your will in my life. Please remember God designed each equipment in the temple. God has a design for every Christian when he saves you. He has a purpose. God has a design for you as a single. God has a design for you if you are married, if you have children. Children, God has a design for you how he wants to use your life. So when we say, I am holy, it means that, Lord, I am aware of that. I will not move it out of the temple. Now, I'm not saying that you don't leave church, you, you stay in church all day long. means to say, now, everything else, everything else is subsumed under. Everything else is under. My, my studies, my pursuits, my hobbies, the way I spend my time, my money, they are all under this one big important umbrella called your purpose. God says in the end times, men will be unholy, not just that, well, God did talk about the, the immodesty in the world, the carnality, the fornication in the world. God did talk about that. But here God says in the church, in a sense, we are not very different. When it comes to obeying God's word, not just, don't talk about consecration, just about God's word. God says Christians would be unholy means they would hold back. They would pick and choose. They would say, God, in many areas, I agree, I obey, but in areas where I don't agree and it will cost me, I will not be holy in all manner of conversation. I will not obey everything. Hence, when God says, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be holy in conversation, all manner is the clarification that God gives. Not just in conversation, be holy in all manner. Because in the end times, Christians will not be holy in all manner of conversation. When it comes to practices, we will not. Look at the retirement life of Christians today. How many are really using it for God? How many will make sure that they splurge and spend all their savings on themselves before they die. They will not say, well, this money is yours, God. I have to be careful even when I'm old. How many will say, I'm giving it all away to my children, my grandchildren? What? For God? I work very hard for this, you know. Think of student life. God, I'm willing to attend a sound church. God, I'm willing to be modest and all that. But you know, certain friendships that I have, God, can you please don't touch those friendships? They mean too much to me. Today, Christians, when you tell them, avoid certain friendships, they get angry at you. The consecrated life, when preached in churches, is considered extreme, unreasonable. It's unreasonable to expect me to live like that for God. Now, that's exactly what God is saying. In the end times, Christians will be unholy, meaning Christians would argue with you. Christians would resist the whole idea of being set apart and totally devoted to and consecrated to the purposes of God in total obedience to every command of God. God says, in perilous times, Believers will be like that in church. Now, when you ask, when you begin to realize that, then we must ask ourselves, am I in this category? Am I in this category? As long as you have reservations when it comes to consecration, 
As long as you still feel that it's extreme to be totally devoted to God at all costs, as long as you still struggle and do not want to stop a certain lifestyle, to stop a certain thing that you're doing in life, to obey God, then I'm afraid you and I have to bow our heads and say, Lord, I am among this that you talk about. Men shall be unholy. Perhaps I should put my name there. I will be unholy. All right, so Christians, don't look at this and just say, well, I'm not unholy because all my outward dressing and practices are fine. No, there is one thing that is at the bottom line that, is, that hits the nerve, that hits the nerve that goes right to the bottom line of holiness that is separating myself totally to God. All right? Now, we are not talking about, and I just want to make sure I clarify, we are not talking about being a hermit. We are not talking about um, being a monk and not go into the world to work and just live in the mountain and live um, in, in, a, in, a, in a monastery and don't come out. Don't interact with anyone. All right? That is not the meaning of separation. Separation is something to do with the heart. You can be in the world. You can be among your ungodly friends or ungodly, if there's such a thing, I know. Actually, there is such a thing, unholy Christians. All right? You can be among Christians who, who are living in disobedience to God's word, but your heart never follows them. You interact with them because you have to. It's school projects. You interact with them because you want to help them to be holy. So it's not running away. You can live in the deepest forest with nothing but your heart can still be unholy, all right? Still lusting after your former lust. Now, young ones, do you want to be holy or unholy? I hope that today you remember being holy means I devote my life to God. God says that in the last days, it will be Men will be lovers of themselves. You're going to study later on. Oh, well, we, didn't, we already studied that. Men will be lovers of themselves. Now, how, will, how does the Christian become unholy? How does a Christian become unholy? Look at your memory verse. Chapter, 2 Timothy, let's turn there. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. How do we progress to this stage? 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now, as I've highlighted before, chapter 3, now let us just read from verses 1 to 2, reading. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Why is it perilous? Why? Why is it perilous? Why choose that word? Because there is a dangerous progression that will happen to the Christian that is dangerous. That is why we are in peril. Now, if you look at the list that God brings up, well, in a church, does it start straight away? Men shall be unholy. Isn't that the most important thing to highlight? Christians must be holy. God says, be holy for I am holy. But notice God did not bring up men will be unholy first. Because we are believers, we are saved. This progression after salvation, instead of a progressive sanctification to more and more holiness, we are warned of a progressive desanctification to the point where God has to say, I'm afraid, Paul, you have to tell Timothy 
there will be unholy people in church. How does it progress in this perilous way? Well, look at verse 2. Instead of saying whole, men will be unholy first, which we naturally would think would be the choice, he would say men will be lovers of themselves. Now remember, holy means I separate myself to the purposes of God and I unreservedly practice what God asked me to do, right? That is the bottom line definition. If you are a lover of self, why would you surrender your life to the purpose of, of God? Why would you? That is why God, before he dealt with holiness, he wants us to realize if you do not deny yourself totally, if you do not be dead to your former lust, as long as you still think, you know, I think uh, our church is quite extreme. Be so serious about everything. Be so extreme in everything. Be so total, so black and white about everything. Uh, not necessary. There's room for me to love myself, to pamper myself, to do what I like to do, what I want to do. Why must I sacrifice everything? As long as I'm obeying God here and there, that's good enough. Now, God wants, before he talks about men will be unholy, he wants men will be lovers of themselves. It means you and I, that will be that former lust that will still continue to come and plague us. And as long as we don't say, Lord, I sacrifice all to you. Now, young person, as long as you know that there is still a particular sin in your life, whatever it is, it may be an unequal thought. It may be some lust for, for the things of the world. It may be some fleshly lust. You will not go any further in your holiness as long as you don't crucify the flesh, mortify the flesh. God always talks about sanctification, in, in other words, holiness, in relation to mortification of the flesh, as long as you still allow yourself to love your flesh and let your flesh dominate you in certain areas, it will progress to unholiness. So remember, lovers of self will never be holy because you will never surrender your life to the purpose of God. You will always seek to fulfill your own purposes. Covetous. As long as there are things that you still lust after. And you don't say, I am dead to this world and its temptations and its glitter and its glamour. As long as you are still covetous. Why would you want to obey God and practice His word totally? You will not be holy by the definition, the scriptural definition of holy. Because as long as you're covetous, I want that thing. I want that job. I want that amount of money. I want that relationship. I want that as long as you are still covetous. When the crunch comes and you need to make a choice in obeying God, you will not practice what God would say. You will rationalize. You will say, it's, it should be okay. Remember, separate, holiness is a separation to practice the ways, the word of God. Absolutely. It's easy to rationalize when you're covetous. It's very difficult to, rational, to, to reason with a covetous person. Parents, you know that. When your child wants something, they have a lot of excuses. They are very good in their reasoning to explain to you why they, it should be okay. You will not separate yourself. You want to say, enough. I'm, yes, 
obeying and doing this, in the eyes of other Christians, is not so necessary, but in my heart, I know, my conscience tells me, this is how I should live. This is what I should do. I will separate myself to do this, even if other Christians don't do it. Now, look further. Chapter 3, verse 2. Boasters. Now, as long as there are things in your life that you love to boast about, that you're proud of, boasting and pride, as long as those things are not crucified, dealt with totally. Holiness is, is total, absolute. Separating yourself from anything that you long for, that you feel, I must have this. This is the pride of my life. This child is the pride of my life. My child must be this. You are not going to separate yourself and your child onto God. You will always have reasons why you should do this for your child. You should do that because that is your pride. It could be a job. It could be whatever else, right? I'm just giving examples. Blasphemers. We studied what blasphemer, blasphemy is. As long as you don't have the highest thought of God and His Word. Why would you be holy? Because, because holiness means absolute submission and surrender to His purpose and total obedience to His Word. Blasphemy means I don't have this thought of God. He's not that high and mighty and supreme that I should totally, that I am just for Him. I must obey everything that He says. You know, there are various, various sins in the Bible when the Christians don't obey. God says it's blasphemy. Why does God relate certain sins of disobedience as blasphemy? God is simply telling the Christian, I said this, but, in, but you say it is not important and you don't intend to obey it. That is why God says it's blasphemy. You see, as long as we are people that do not have the highest reverence of God, then His purposes and His word are, are, are things we, we readily compromise without feeling there is anything bad. Are we like that? God says we are unholy. And then the last one, the last two, disobedient to parents, unthankful, then God says unholy. We studied that as well. Why would you obey God's word totally, absolutely, without argument, without reservation, without rationalizing, when your parent who stands in front of you, whom you know sacrifice for you and love you, and you're dependent, if you, you know you're dependent on your parent as a young child, if you would not obey your parent, why would you be holy means I will obey in practices everything that God says. You see the progression before it reaches unholy. Parents understand this. Training of your child in obedience is the foundation for holiness. You must remember that. Children, if you struggle in obeying daddy and mommy, and in your heart say, I want to grow up to be a holy boy, holy man, holy girl, holy lady. I want to. Then you say, I, I train myself now. I've said that many times. Same for the adult. I train myself now. I will humble myself. I won't be proud. When, when it is embarrassing for me to say, I was wrong. I must obey. I must do this now. Just humble yourself. Don't be proud. You know, suddenly becoming an obedient child can be very embarrassing. Right? You have been disobedient. You talk back to your parents all this while. And suddenly you realize, oh, this will slowly progress me to be an unholy adult. Tonight onwards when I go home, I will learn whenever daddy and mommy say something, as long as it is not sinful, I will say yes, all right. Even if I don't like it, because I'm training myself to the point where I will be holy in all manner of conversation. Whatever God says, I will obey. Unthankful. Why do I harp so much on training children to be thankful? If you are not thankful, you will be unholy. You will progress to that. Why? Why would you give, wrong word, 
Why would you return your life to God and let God decide and let God use it as He wishes, totally separated and devoted and consecrated to His use? Why would you totally ignore your own will? If you are someone who is unthankful, you would not. No matter how God shows to you the sacrifice, how undeserving you and I are of the least of His mercies, because we have grown up unthankful, we won't appreciate, we feel a sense of entitlement. If you do not change that, you will be the same with God. God why, why do you demand that I must live holy life? Why do you demand that my life is for you? Because I redeemed you with my blood. Because I took your place. If not for me, you are hellbound. If not for my mercies, you can't even eat today. Everything, every single breath you can take is, the, is my mercies towards you. Really? You are unthankful. You will not be thankful. You will not be thankful to the stage where you say, Lord, you can take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to you. It's the least. It's the least I can do. Consecrating, offering my body up as a living sacrifice is the least I can do. Unthankfulness, or rather thankfulness, is what will make you a holy person. You will, told, you will, you will willingly you won't use the word, I give my life to you, God. You will always say, God, my undeserving returning of my life, even if I return my life one million times over to you, God, it is still not enough. Because really, no matter how thankful I am, I still never can repay the debt of love. You see, thankfulness, training your child to be thankful, is training them to grow up one day to really appreciate what God has done. And then when you say, be ye holy, yes, I will separate myself without reservation. Of course I will, God, because God did everything for me. I owe everything to Him. Of course I must. If I don't, then I must be the most unthankful child on earth. Right, Daddy and Mommy? That is what you will say. Now, I shared with you this story, right? This, this testimony. This child... They were, the father and mother were going, the mother and, and this child was going through a war. They were dying of hunger. And that the child knew that this is the last meal that they have, a small morsel. And the child said to the, parent, to the mother, Look, Mother, after this, we have nothing to eat and we'll probably starve to death, right, mom? And the child said, Yes, my child, if you don't get any more food, we will die of hunger. And then the child said, But even if God let us die for, of hunger, we must still love Him because He died for us. Why? Because the child is so thankful to salvation. The child is willing to, to submit to any will of God. That is holiness, a total consecration and submission to the purpose of God, whatever He chooses and allows, and total obedience, absolute obedience. Not God, why? Always asking why. A thankful child does not ask why. The thankful child just asks, how much more do you want me to do? So my dear friends, in closing, as long as you are still someone who after understanding what holiness means, still have reservations, still feel that total consecration unconditional surrender and absolute obedience to every commandment of God to the highest degree is unreasonable. Then I'm afraid that you have fallen to the end times, perilous characteristic of what God says will be among certain Christians. Because a life of total consecration and devotion to God is supposed to be a very normal, a very normal Christian life. A life that is, that you will not even question 
Like the Apostle Paul, it never passes his mind to say that what Christ put him through, what Christ wants him to be, what Christ wants him to do in obedience, it never crosses his mind that it's too much. Never. Never. Because it's normal. If you still think it's abnormal, it's extreme, you are, you have succumbed to the deception of Satan. Because God says, be ye holy, for I am holy. What Satan wants is, be unholy, because your God is holy. I do not want you to be like him. Let us pray. Our gracious, loving, heavenly Father, Lord, may we not think of holiness as just external things that we do, but truly something within us first and foremost of total separation from the world, total separation from self-will onto your purposes and to practice absolutely, totally in obedience to every word that we come to know of your instructions. Lord, we pray that we will not succumb and be deceived and have become unholy and still rationalize that holy life is too extreme. Oh Lord, be merciful to this church. Build up young ones. Lord, that will grow up to be holy men and women, that every one of us will grow to, sen to senior hope, seniorhood, being holy people. For thy name's sake we pray. We ask that you will meet with us in the place of prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.